This live SLU show is brought to you by the support of SLU members and the following sponsors. Visit SLU.com to become a member today. Hey everybody, welcome to SLU. I'm Bob Berman, SLU astronomer, and I'm here to explore with you the blue moon. We all know it's the blue moon. Boy, the media has been going crazy with this one. They love it, and we love it too. We're going to look at it starting right now with an image from our SLU observatory, all sky view on the Canary Islands. This is the moon in the sky. It looks like a daytime sky with the sun, but no, it's night. And when you have a uh, bright enough camera with a good enough exposure, the night sky actually looks blue when it's the night of the full moon. And that's it, full moon. And we can use our telescopes. We've got them both pointed to actually all three pointed to the moon right now. So let's zoom in without any delay. And this is live here at SLU, live image. We're going to stick with this one for a little bit. Our lowest power, highest possible field of view, widest field of view, beautiful picture of the full moon. The second full moon in July, that makes it a blue moon by definition. But that's not good enough for a lot of people. They're saying, well, what does that mean exactly? It doesn't look blue, does it? Well, it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. The blue moon is just a word for the second full moon in the same calendar month. Now, since the moon's period of phases is 29 and a half days and since most months have 30 or 31 days it follows that if there is a full moon on the first or second day of the month as there was here in July there will definitely be another one at the end of the month now this happens every 30 months every two and a half years so a blue moon isn't that rare you know when we say once in a blue moon we think of something that's uh, a little bit less frequent than once every two and a half years, but that's what we've got. And just to make it more complex, there's a second definition. Some say that the blue moon is actually the third full moon when there's four in a single season, astronomical season. Now we know a season begins at an equinox and ends at a solstice, or begins at a solstice and ends at an equinox. So we have the summer season, winter season, etc. Normally that's three months, so normally that's three full moons. But again, since the full moon's lunation period, or synodic period, or period of phases is 29 and a half days, once in a while, same, same period, once every two and a half years or so, you'll get four full moons in a single season. And then by this other definition, the third of those is the blue moon. That's not what's happening tonight. That's not the definition we're using. Where did that come from anyway? Well, I don't want to disappoint everybody, but this is not one of those things that has any astronomical basis. There's nothing that the moon does that's different. There's no behavior that makes it worthy of the blue moon, nor is there any lore or legend or mythology behind it. The Native Americans never called the third of four um, full moons in a season a blue moon. They didn't say a second full moon in a single month was the blue moon. It didn't came, come from them, it didn't come from the ancient Greeks, it didn't come from the Mayans, it came from nobody. Actually in Maine, some people, not the majority, but in some folklore, the third of four full moons in a single season was called a blue moon. And so there was an almanac in Maine, a local publication that mentioned that. And when an astronomy magazine, not mine, which is astronomy magazine, but the competitor was doing a story about that in the 1940s, the writer got it wrong. 
and instead of writing it that way, he wrote that a blue moon was locally called the second full moon in the same month. And so from this mistaken idea, from this error, came that definition, the one we're using tonight, the one the media is using, that the uh, blue moon is the second full moon in a calendar month. And that one caught on. It went viral. Although those days there were no viruses in the computer sense, of course. But that became more and more better known. This still remains nothing that we use in astronomy. Astronomers will never say this is a blue moon. We, we don't use that term. It's a new thing, a new idea, mostly a media thing. So what there is, though, is the full moon. That's happening today. Anything special about the July full moon? Not really. The June full moon has something special in that it's the lowest down full moon of the year. And since low moons are more amber or yellow colored, maybe that's the origin of the term honey moon. Because the full moon of June is honey colored. And June is the traditional month for weddings. So that moon has a little bit of juice to it. The December and January full moons are the highest up of the year. They get to almost straight overhead, but not straight overhead from anywhere except from Hawaii. But because they're so high and because the January and December air is so dry because it's cold, those are the whitest and brightest full moons of the year. So you think there'd be some kind of name associated with that, but there isn't. Those moons have no special name. In fact, the Native Americans had different names for each month moon, and they never agreed with each other. The Algonquins said one thing, the Dakota Sioux said another, the Apache said something else, and so there is no agreement. So the bottom line, my friends here at SLU and our members listening to us, is that there are only two official full moons each year. One is the harvest moon, defined as the closest full moon to the September equinox, and the next full moon after that, the hunter's moon. And those moons are special. They don't look special, but they do something special. Their behavior is unusual. So those only two moons that actually have astronomically accepted definitions, the only two full moons in the year that are, boom, official, the harvest and the hunter's moon, what they do, especially the harvest moon, is they rise at almost the same time, night after night. Normally, the moon comes up about an hour later each night. But the harvest moon only comes up about 20 minutes later, night after night. So picture the harried farmer trying to finish his or her harvesting tasks, running out of daylight, the sun has set, and boom, there comes the full moon, the September full moon, which always rises at sunset, giving them needed sunlight to finish their harvesting tasks. And it does this night after night after night, rising at almost the same time night after night. So that is a special moon. So there's our one notably different full moon, the harvest moon. Nonetheless, this is the full moon where we're celebrating it. And here at SLU, you know, we always celebrate special events. We're using the Canary Islands telescopes. I'm showing you views through uh, some of our different telescopes. We can zoom in and use our higher magnification uh, T2. We use a T1 instrument. And look at these nice pictures. You see those rays streaming out of the bottommost crater? That's the crater Tycho, where the moon, bam, got hit by a recent meteor impact. And just above center, a little bit to the upper left of center, there's another big white crater that has rays streaming out of it. This is the famous Copernicus, about uh, almost 60 miles in diameter. Beautiful crater when the moon is full the way it is now. You can't really see the crater walls and the mountains in the center, kind of all the details washed out. Generally, we don't even like to look at the moon telescopically when it's full moon because we don't have the correct lighting to see mountain ranges or craters. But, you know, we're making an exception because it's the blue moon. And here we are zooming in a little bit more, looking at those dark blotches or maria, the plural of mare or sea, because early observers, including Galileo, thought that these were oceans on the moon. So we still use that term. And all the oceans have names that are either, and this is strange, they're either named after um, emotions, you know, like the Sea of Tranquility, the Sea of Serenity, the little uh, dark one on the right, very, very round, small one is the Sea of Crises, 
you know. So if you're going through some kind of neurotic episodes, uh, you can tell your therapist that you saw the sea of crises. Not just one crisis, but many crises. That's, that's its name. Or some of the blotches are named after weather phenomena, like the sea of storms, the ocean of rains. So funny, either emotions or weather phenomena. That's what the dark blotches are named for. You know, we always explore, here it's Lou, we always explore the events, the hot current events. Tonight's is the blue moon. What's going to happen on the 8th, that is on Saturday the 8th, we're teaming up with the European Space Agency, the ESA, and we're going to be looking at the latest from the Rosetta mission. You know, and the Rosetta, of course, is orbiting Comet 67P. And we've just learned that the Philae lander, which has come alive, has been detecting organic compounds, 16 of them in the last few days. Organic compounds on comets. Well, not so surprising. We always knew comets had them. But to actually sniff around and detect them live. So we're going to be bringing you a show with the experts. It's a joint show with the European Space Agency. That's so cool here at SLU. And then after that, a few days later, the great Perseid meteor shower, the best meteor shower in years. Now, uh, unlike the uh, pretty pathetic uh, Delta Aquarius a few nights ago that everybody still in enjoyed. Oddly enough, these Perseids are going to put on a heck of a show. We're going to see 60 to 90 meteors per hour using special low-light equipment, and we're going for it. Or you could just watch from your backyard. If you live in a city, forget that. You, you'll never see them. Visit those friends in the country. You know, bring them some pizza or something they can't get up there in the country and spread out some blankets or lawn chairs, but have slew on. So that as we talk about them and tell you cool stuff about the Perseids, and we will, really, really odd, strange things like how high they are and how far apart they are and what you're really seeing, one hint is that you don't really see the meteors. You just see the air glowing around them, how fast they are, and all sorts of cool stuff like that. You can listen to us narrate them while you're watching them. Or if you are in the city or if it's cloudy or rainy or something like that, then join us with our special low-light video camera, and we will bring you the Perseids live. But right now, it is the blue moon. Does it look blue? Moon uh, almost never looks blue. I hate to tell you what would actually cause a blue moon. You, you wouldn't like it. It would be a special kind of chemical spill. So if you live in you know, one of those uh, bad Bhopal-like areas where you're manufacturing truly weird chemicals, uh, and there's a big release of them, you might get a blue moon. Other than that, the, the normal color of the moon is uh, either white or yellow or orange or things like that. Today's the day, the second full moon in the single calendar month. This is the blue moon. The next one won't come up uh, for another uh, two and a half years. So, you know, we're enjoying it, even though... If you tuned in late, it's not a Native American tradition. It's not an astronomical tradition. It didn't even exist, this definition, until World War II. So it's kind of a recent thing, but the media is really on board with this and uh, really enjoying calling the moon something. Maybe we should have names for each full moon of the year because the public likes it, the media likes it. You know, instead of just saying there's the full moon, we could have... Uh, you know, a different label, a different term for each of the moons. We have the harvest moon, we have the hunter's moon, but we don't have any others, unfortunately, because the colonists in the Americas and each uh, tribe of Native Americans had a different name for each moon. For example, we would call the January uh, moon the straw moon or the strawberry moon or the wolf moon or the, you know, different things. So none of them really stuck. And this is a recent name, the blue moon. Um, look how round it looks, though. You know, the moon is the second of two round objects in the sky. And to the ancient Greeks and many other cultures, round was the divine geometric shape. Because the circumference doesn't have a beginning or an end, does it? And everywhere along the circumference, you're the same distance from the center. So to them, the circle was heavenly and magical. And we still have that tradition in ceremonies such as wedding rings. 
And here we have it with the moon, because the moon looks perfectly round to the eye. The, uh, the diameter is 2,160 miles, and the out of roundness is only four miles. In other words, one part in 500. And no eye can detect an out of roundness of only one part in 500. So along with the sun, these are our perfectly round uh, objects. Think of what else in nature is perfectly round. You know, grapefruit, oranges, uh, cherries, they're roundish. But you don't get perfectly round a lot. So, you know, it's kind of cool. So there's a lot of different aspects to it. And, of course, we know how the full moon, every full moon, is a time of the highest tides. The actual, bam, highest of the high tides happen one day after full moon. So look for that tomorrow. But in general, if you're going to the beach these days, good idea. Uh, this is when you get the highest highs and the lowest lows as opposed to two weeks from now when you get neap tides that are kind of wishy-washy tides. The highs are not very high, the lows are not very low. These are the great tides, you know, the highs come out almost to the boardwalk and the lows expose a lot of sand for clam diggers and, and the like. So it really does affect us, it affects uh, ocean life, especially in the intertidal marshes clams, creatures like that, and they're predators like gulls. They're all attuned to it. They all know when it's going to be the full moon or the new moon, when the tides are highest. So there is a, a, a nice uh, relationship between the earth and the heavens. And uh, we'll continue to bring you that relationship here at SLU whenever there is a special celestial event, and there is always one. Every few days or every week or two, we're always here with that from our live Canary Island telescopes here at SLU. Always on guard duty for you, always watching for uh, these great things, whether it's a close approach by a, an asteroid or a comet that brightens up. Yeah, just um, keep watching our schedule and join us for the next one, please. It's been my pleasure to be here with you for SLU. I'm Bob Berman. Good night.